The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Nope, oh, too much. Ah, there it is. Got to get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay, and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you? And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to the Brief History Podcast. My name's Andrew Knight. I'm the host. Sound editing and composing is done by Harry Edmondson. Today's episode is regarding the Korea War. Everything from the start of the Korea War leader up to the present day. Uh, we're looking to do this over several episodes. It's a really meaty topic. Um, so we're uh, very much looking forward to it. Uh, thank you for, once again for everybody who's contacted us on social media. Thank you for everybody who has left some kind messages. Um, just going forward uh, this week and uh, next, we're going to trial uh, not playing ongoing music um, as I talk. Um, this is direct feedback from you guys. Um, so let me know how you feel this differs from any other episodes. And if there's any more room for improvement, anything else you'd like us to try, then please let us know. Uh, but thank you once again for any feedback, positive or, or negative. Um, you're very kind. Um, don't forget to subscribe to us on your usual podcast apps. Uh, we're on all the major podcast uh, directories, so you'll find us there. Um, if you can, please leave us a five-star review um, and a rating. It really does help. It only takes seconds, and uh, just think it is your good deed of the day. Any new podcast relies on the generosity of his listeners, and you guys have been marvellous so far. Uh, please uh, let it continue. Uh, if you haven't already do so, five-star review, please. Uh, find us on all the social media sites. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. We're at Be History Podcast on all of those. Um, so look out for us there. If you'd be kind enough to leave a, um, a comment, uh, send us a message, like, retweet, follow. Uh, you guys know the school. Um, please, we really do uh, uh, appreciate any interaction uh, with you. So uh, thank you once again. The Korean War was a war between North Korea with the support of China and the Soviet Union and South Korea with the principal support of the United States. The war began on the 25th of June 1950 when North Korea invaded South Korea following a series of clashes along the border. The United Nations with the United States as principal force came to the aid of South Korea. China came to the aid of North Korea and the Soviet Union also gave assistance to the North. As a product of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, Korea was split into two regions with separate governments. Both claimed to be the legitimate government of all Korea, neither accepted the border as permanent. The conflict escalated into open warfare when North Korean forces, supported by the Soviet Union and China, moved into the South on the 25th of June 1950. The United Nations Security Council authorised the formation and dispatch of United UN forces to Korea to repel what was recognised as a North Korean invasion. 21 countries of the United Nations eventually contributed to the UN force, with the United States providing around 90% of the military personnel. After the first two months of war, South Korea and the US forces rapidly dispatched to Korea were on the point of defeat, 
forced back to a smaller area in the south known as the Poussin perimeter. In September 1950, an ambitious UN counter-offensive was launched at Incheon and cut off many North Korean troops. Those who escaped, enveloped and captured were forced back north. UN forces rapidly approached the Yula River, the border with China, but in October 1950, mass Chinese forces crossed the Yalu and entered the war. The surprise Chinese invention triggered a treat of UN forces, which continued until mid-1951. After these reversals of fortune, which saw Seoul change hands four times, the last two years of fighting became a war of attrition, with the front line close to the 38th parallel. The war in the air, however, was never a stalemate. North Korea was subject to a massive bombing campaign. Jet fighters confronted each other in air-to-air -air combat for the first time in history, and Soviet pilots covertly flew in defence of their communist allies. The fighting ended on the 27th of July 1953, when an armistice was signed. The agreement was created, and the Korean demilitarization zone was separated the North and South, and allowed the return of prisoners. However, no peace treaty has been signed, and according to some sources, the two Koreas were technically still at war, engaging in a frozen conflict. In April 2018, the leaders of North Korea and South met at the demilitarization zone and agreed to sign a treaty by the end of the year to formally end the Korean War. As a war undeclared by all participants, the conflict helped bring the term police action into common use. It also led to the permanent alteration of balance of power within the United Nations, where Resolution 377 passed in 1950 to allow bypassing the Security Council if that body could not reach an agreement, led to the General Assembly displacing the Security Council as the organ of the UN. In South Korea, the war is usually referred to as 625 or the 625 upheaval, deflecting the date of the complacement on 25th of June. In North Korea, the war is officially referred to as the Fatherland Liberation War, or alternatively the Kushan or Korea War. In China, the war is officially called the War to Resist America in Aid Korea although the term Korean War is also used in unofficial contexts, along with the term Han War or Korean War in Chinese. More commonly used in regions such as Hong Kong and Macau. In the US, the war was initially described by President S. Truman as police action, as it was an undeclared military action conducted under the auspices of United Nations. It's been referred to in the English-speaking war as the Forgotten War or the Unnamed War because of the lack of public attention it received both during and after the war and in reflection to the global scale of World War II, which it preceded and the subservient angst of the Soviet or the war, war, Soviet wars, or in some cases, the US-Vietnam War, which it also succeeded. The Imperial Japanese rule in 1910 to 1940 that destroyed the influence of China over Korea in the First Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 95, ushering in a short-lived Korean Empire. A decade later, after defeating Imperial Russia in the Russia-Japanese War, 1905 to 04. Japan made Korea its protectorate with the Elusa Treaty in 1905, then annexed it with the Japanese-Korean Annexation Treaty in 1910. Many Korean nationalists fled the country. A provincial government of the Republic of Korea was founded in 1919 in nationalist China. It failed to achieve international recognition, failed to unite nationalist groups and had a fractious relationship with his US-based founding president, Singh Man Rhee. From 1919 to 1925 and beyond, Korean communists led internal and external warfare against the Japanese. In China, the Nationalist National Revolutionary Army and the Communist People's Liberation Army helped recognise the 
and organised the Korean refugees against the Japanese military, which also occupied parts of China. The nationalist-backed Koreans, led by Yo Pung Suk, fought in the Burma campaign December 1941 to August 1945. The communists led by Kim Il-sung, among others, fought the Japanese in Korea and Manchuria. After the Cairo Conference in November 1943, China, the United Kingdom and the United States all decided that, quote, in due course, Korea shall become free and independent, end quote. After the Tehran Conference in, in November 1943 and at the Yalta Conference in February 1945, the Soviet Union promised to join its allies in the Pacific War within three months of the victory in Europe. Accordingly, it declared war on Japan in the 9th of August 1945, three days after the Japanese bomb of Hiroshima dropped by the USA. By the 10th of August, the Red Army began to occupy the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. On the 9th of the 10th of August, in Washington, USA, Colonels Dean Rusk and Charles H. Bonesteel III were tasked with dividing the Korean Peninsula into Soviet and US occupational zones and proposed the 38th parallel. This was incorporated into the U.S. General Order No. 1, which responded to the Japanese surrender on the 15th of August. According to the choice of the 38th parallel, Rusk observed, quote, even though it was further north than it could be realistically reached by U.S. forces in the event of a Soviet disagreement, we felt it important to include the capital of Korea in the area of responsibility of American troops, end quote. He also noted he was, quote, faced with this scarcity of U.S. forces immediately available and time and space factors would make it difficult to reach very far north before Soviet troops could enter the area, end quote. As Rusk's comments indicated, the U.S. doubted whether the Soviet government would agree to this. Stalin, however, maintained his wartime policy of cooperation and on the 16th of August, the Red Army halted at the 38th parallel for three weeks to await the arrival of US forces in the south. On the 8th of September 1945, US Lieutenant General John R. Hodge arrived in Incheon to accept the Japanese surrender south of the 38th parallel. Appointed as military governor, General Hodge directly controlled South Korea as head of the United States Military Art Government in Korea, USA MGIK, 1945-48. He attempted to establish control by restoring Japanese colonial administration to power, but in the face of Korean protests, he quickly reversed this decision. The USA MGIK refused to recognise the provincial government as short-lived People's Republic of Korea, the PRK, due to his suspected communist sympathies. In December 1945, Korea was administered by US-Soviet Union Joint Commission as agreed by the Moscow Conference with the aim of granted independence after a five-year trusteeship. The idea was not popular among the Koreans and rights broke out. The idea was not popular among Koreans and riots broke out. To contain them, the USMGIK banned strikes on the 8th of December 1945 and outlawed the PRK Revolutionary Government and the PRK People's Committees on the 12th of December 1945. The right-wing representative Democratic Council, led by Sang Mangjuri, had arrived with US military, opposed the trusteeship, arguing that Korea had already suffered from foreign occupation far too long. Following further large-scale civilian unrest, the USMGIK declared martial law. Citing the inability of the Joint Commission to make progress, the US government decided to hold an election under United Nations backing with the aim of creating an independent Korea. The Soviet authorities and the Korean communists refused to cooperate on the grounds it would not be fair, and many South Korean politicians boycotted it. A general election was held in the South on the 10th of May 1948. North Korea held parliamentary elections three months later on the 25th of August. 
The resultant South Korea government promulgated a national political constitution on the 17th of July 1948 and elected Sung Man Ri as president on the 20th of July 1948. The Republic of Korea, South Korea, was established on the 15th of August 1948. In the Soviet Korean zone of occupation, the Soviet Union established a communist government led by King Il Sung. The Soviet Union withdrew as agreed from Korea in 1948, and the US troops withdrew in 1949. With the end of the war with Japan, the Chinese Civil War resumed between the communists and nationalists. While the communists were struggling for supremacy in Manchuria, they were supported by the North Korean government with, with material and manpower. According to Chinese sources, the North Koreans donated 2,000 railway cars worth of supplies, while thousands of Koreans served in the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the PLA, during the war. North Korea also provided the Chinese communists in Manchuria with a safe refuge for non-combatants and communications with the rest of China. The North Korean contributions to the Chinese Communist victory was not forgotten after the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949. As a token of gratitude, between 50,000 and 70,000 Korean veterans who served in the PLA were sent back along with their weapons, and they later played a significant role in the initial invasion of South Korea. China promised to support the North Koreans in the event of a war against South Korea. The Chinese support created a deep division between the Korean Communists and King il sungs authority within the Communist Party, which was challenged by the Chinese faction led by Pak il yung who were later purged by King. After the formation of the People's Republic of China in 1949, the Chinese government named the Western nations, led by the United States, as the biggest threat to its national security. Basing this judgment on China's century of humiliation, beginning in the early 19th century, US support for the nationalists during the Chinese Civil War and their ideological struggles between revolutionaries and reactionaries, the Chinese leadership believed that China would become critical background in the United States' crusade against communism. As a countermeasure, and to elevate China's standard among the worldwide communist movements, the Chinese leadership adopted a foreign policy that actively promoted communist revolutions through properties and territories on China's periphery. By 1949, South Korea forces had reduced the active number of communist guerrillas in the South from 5,000 to 1,000. However, King il sung believed that the communist Communist guerrillas weakened the South Korean military and that a North Korean invasion would be welcomed by much of South Korean population. Kim began seeking Stalin's support for an invasion in March 1949, travelling to Moscow to attempt to persuade him. Serious border clashes between South and North occurred on August 4, 1949, when thousands of North Korean troops attacked South Korean troops occupying territory north of the 38th parallel. The 2nd and 18th Infantry Regiments of ROKA repulsed initial attacks in Kolksa Bong, which was above the 38th parallel, and Chemungum. At the end of the clashes, the ROKA troops were completely routed. Stalin initially did not think that the time was right for a war in Korea. Chinese communist forces were still embroidered in the Chinese Civil War, while US forces remained stationed in South Korea. By spring 1950, he believed that the strategic situation had changed. Mao's communist forces had secured final victory in China. US forces had withdrawn from Korea, and the Soviets detonated their first nuclear bomb, breaking the US atomic monopoly. As the US had not directly intervened to stop the communist victory in China, Stalin calculated they would be even less willing to fight in Korea, which had much less strategic significance. The Soviets also cracked the codes used by the US to communicate with their embassy in Moscow, and reading these dispatches can convince Stalin that Korea did not have the importance to the US that would warrant a nuclear confrontation. Stalin began a more aggressive strategy in Asia,
based on these developments, including promising economic and military aid to China through the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance. In April 1950, Stalin gave Kim permission to invade the South under condition that Mao would agree to send reinforcements if needed. Stalin made it clear that Soviet forces would not openly engage in combat to avoid direct war with the United States. Kim met with Mao in 1950. Mao was concerned the US would intervene but agreed to support the North Korean invasion. China desperately needed the economic and military aid promised by the Soviets. However, Mao sent more ethnic Korean PLA veterans to Korea and promised to move an army closer to the Korean border. Once Mao's communist commitment was secured, preparations for the war accelerated. Soviet generals with extensive combat experience from the Second World War were sent to North Korea as the Soviet advisory group. These generals completed the plans for attack by May. The original plans called for a skirmish to be initiated by the Onji Peninsula on the west coast of Korea. The North Koreans would then launch a counterattack that would capture Seoul and encircle the destroyed South Korean army. The final stage would involve in destroying South Korean government remnants, capturing the rest of South Korea, including all the ports. On the 7th of June 1950, Kim Il-sung agreed for a Korean-wide election on the 5th to the 8th of August 1950 and a consultative conference in Haju on the 15th to the 17th of June 1950. On the 11th of June, the North sent three diplomats to the South as a peace overture that Ria rejected outright. On the 21st of June, King El Sun advised his war plan to involve a general attack along the, the 38th parallel rather than a limited operation in the Onjin Peninsula. Kim was concerned that South Korean agents learned about the plans and the South Korean forces were strengthening their defences. Stalin agreed to change his plans. While these preparations were underway in the north, there were frequent clashes along the 38th parallel, especially at Kaesong and the Onjin, many initiated by the south. The Republic of Korea Army, the ROK Army, was being trained by the USA. The Korean Military Advisory Group, the KMAG, on the eve of the war, the KMAG's commander, William Lynn Roberts, voice and at most confidence of the ROK army and boast that any North Korean invasion was merely provided target practice. For his part, Sing Man Ri reportedly expressed his desire to conquer the North, including when US diplomat John Foster Jules visited Korea on the 18th of June. Although some South Korean and US intelligence officers predicted an attack from the North, similar predictions were made before and nothing had happened. The Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, noted that southward movement by the Korean Armed People's Army, the KPA, had been assessed this as a defensive measure and concluded an invasion was unlikely. On the 23rd of June, UN observers inspected the border and it did not attack that war was imminent. Throughout 1949 to 1950, the Soviets continued arming North Korea. After the communist victory in the Chinese Civil War, ethnic Korean units and the Chinese People's Liberation Army were released to North Korea. The combat veteran from China, the tanks, artillery and aircraft supplied by the Soviets and their rigorous training increased North Korea's military superiority over the South armed by the US military with mostly small arms and given no heavy weaponry such as tanks. According to the first official census in 1949, the population of North Korea numbered 9,620,000 and by mid-1950 North Korean forces outnumbered or numbered between 150,000 to 200,000 troops, organised into 10 infantry divisions, one tank division and one air force division, with 210 fighter planes and 280 tanks, who captured scheduled objectives and territory, among them Kaesong, Shengsheng, Ujabu and Onjin. Their forces included 274 T-34-85 tanks, 200 artillery pieces, 
110 attack bombers and some 150 Yak fighters planes with 35 reconnaissance aircraft. In addition to the invasion force, the North KPA had 114 fighters, 78 bombers, 105 T-35-85 tanks and some 30,000 soldiers stationed in reserve in North Korea. Although each navy consisted of only several small warships, the North and South Korean navies fought in the war as seaborne artillery for their armies. In contrast, the Republic of Korea population totaled 20,188,641 and its army was unprepared and ill-equipped. As of 25th of June 1950, the ROK army had 98 thousand soldiers, 60, 65,000 combat and 33,000 support, no tanks, though they had requested from the US military and requests had been denied, and a 22-piece air force comprising of 12 liaison type and 10 AT-6 advanced trainer airplanes. Large US garrisons and air forces were in Japan, but only 200 to 300 American troops were in Korea itself. At the dawn on a Sunday, the 25th of June, 1950, the Korean People's Army crossed the 38th parallel behind artillery fire. The KPA justified its assault with the claim that ROK troops attacked first and that KPA was aiming to arrest and execute the bandit traitor Sing Man Ri. Fighting began on the strategic Onjin Peninsula in the west. There were initial South Korean claims that they captured the city of Hunju and their subsequent of events led to some scholars to argue that the South Koreans first fired first. However, the first shots that fired in Onjin within an hour, North Korean forces attacked all along the 38th parallel. The North Koreans had combined armed force, including tanks supported by heavy artillery. The South Koreans had no tanks, anti-tank weapons or heavy artillery to stop such an attack. In addition, South Koreans committed their forces in piecemeal fashion and those were routed in a few days. On the 27th of June, re evacuated from Seoul with some of his government. On the 28th of June at 2am, the South Korean army blew up the highway Hang Ang Bridge across Han River in an attempt to stop the North Korean army. The bridge was detonated while 4,000 refugees were crossing it and hundreds were killed. Destroying the bridge also trapped many South Korean military units north of the Han River. In spite of such desperate measures, Seoul fell that same day. A number of South Korean National Assembly men remained in Seoul when it fell and 48 subsequently pledged allegiance to the North. On the 28th of June, Re ordered a massacre of suspected political opponents in his own country. In five days, the South Korean forces, which had 95,000 men on 25th of June, was down to less than 22,000. In early July, when US forces arrived, what was left of the South Korean forces were placed under US operational command of the United Nations Command. The Truman administration was unprepared for the invasion. Korea was not included in the strategic Asian defence perimeter outlined by the Secretary of State Dean Ashen. Truman himself was at his home in Independence, Missouri. Military strategists were more concerned with the security of Europe rather than against the Soviet Union than East Asia. At the same time, the administration was worried that a war in Korea would quickly widen into another war of the world, which should the Chinese or Soviets decide if they wanted to get involved. One facet of the changing attitude towards Korea and whether to get involved was Japan. Especially after the fall of China to the communists, US experts on East Asia saw Japan as a critical counterweight to the Soviet Union and China in the region. While there was no United States policy dealing with South Korea directly as a national interest, it, its proximity to Japan increased the importance of South Korea. Kim said the recognition that the security of Japan required a non-hostile Korea directly led to President Truman's decision to intervene. 
the essential point is that the American response to the North Korean attack stemmed from considerations of US policy towards Japan. Another major consideration was the po possible Soviet reaction to the event that the US intervened. The Truman administration was fearful that a war in Japan, Korea was an advisory uh, assault that would escalate to a general war in Europe since the United States committed in Korea. At the same time, there was no suggestion from anyone that the United Nations or the United States could back away from the conflict. Yugoslavia, a possible Soviet target because of the Tito-Stalin split, was vital to defence of Italy and Greece, and the country was the first on the list of the National Security Council's post-North Korea invasion list of chief danger spots. Truman believed that if aggression went unchecked, a train reaction would initiate that would marginalise the United Nations and encourage communist aggression elsewhere. The UN Security Council approved the use of force to help the South Koreans and the US immediately began using what air and naval forces that were in the area to that end. The Truman administration still refrained from committing to the ground because of some advisor believed that the North Koreans could be stopped by air and a naval power alone. The Truman administration was still unconcerned that the attack was employed by the Soviet Union or just a test of Soviet U.S. resolve. The decision to commit ground troops would become viable when a communique was received on the 27th of June indicating that the Soviet Union would not move against U.S. forces in Korea. The Truman administration now believed it could interfere in Korea without undermining its commitments elsewhere. On the 25th of June 1950, the United Nations Security Council unanimously condemned the North Korean invasion of the Republic of Korea with the UN Security Council Resolution 82. The Soviet Union, a veto-wielding power, had boycotted the council meeting since January 1950, protesting that the Taiwanese Republic of China and not the mainland People's Republic of China held a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. After debating the matter, the Security Council on the 27th of June 1950 published Resolution 83 recommending member states provide military assistance to the Republic of Korea. On the 27th of June, President Truman ordered US air and sea forces to help the South Korean regime. On the 4th of July, the Soviet Deputy Foreign Minister accused the United States of starting armed intervention on behalf of South Korea. The Soviet Union challenged the legitimacy of the war for several reasons. The ROK Army intelligence upon which Resolution 83 was based came from US intelligence. North Korea was not invited as a sitting temporary member of the UN, which violated UN Charter Article 32, and the fighting was beyond the UN Charter scope because the initial North-South border fighting was classed as a civil war. Because the Soviet Union was boycotting the Security Council at the time, legal scholars recommended that deciding upon an action of this type required the unanimous vote of all the five permanent members, including the Soviet Union. Within days of the invasion, masses of ROK army soldiers of dubious loyalty to Sung Man Ri regime were retreating southwards or defected en masse to Northside, the KPA. As soon as word of the attack was received, U.S. Secretary of State Dean Arshon informed President Truman that North Koreans had invaded South Korea. Truman agreed aid and discussed the U.S. invasion response. They agreed the United States were obliged to act, paralleling the North Korean invasion with Adolf Hitler's aggressions in the 1930s, with the conclusion being that the mistake of appeasement must not be repeated. Several U.S. industries were mobilized to supply materials, labor, capital, production facilities and other services necessary to support the military objectives of the, the Korean War. However, President Truman later acknowledged that he believed fighting the invasion was essential to the U.S. goal of global containment of communism, as outlined in the National Security Council Report 68. 
in August 1950, the President and the Secretary of State obtained the consent of Congress to appropriate 12 billion for military action in Korea. Because of the extensive defence cuts and the emphasis placed on building nuclear bomber force, none of the services were in a position to make a robust response with conventional military strength. General Omar Bradley, Chairman of the Joint State Chiefs of Staff, were faced with reorganising and deploying a military force that was a shadow of its World War II counterpart. Acting on State Security Arshun's recommendations, President Truman ordered General McCarthy to transfer material to the South Korean military while giving air cover to the evacuation of US nationals. The President disagreed with advisers who recommended unilateral US bombing of North Korean forces and ordered the US 7th Fleet to protect the Republic of China, Taiwan, whose government asked to fight in Korea. The United States denied ROC request for combat, lest it provoke communist Chinese retaliation. Because the United States had sent the 7th Fleet to neutralise the Taiwan Strait, Chinese Premier Zhu Enla criticised both the UN and US initiatives of armed aggression on Chinese territory. The Battle of Ulsan, the first significant US engagement of the Korean War, involved the 540 soldier task force smith which was a small forward element of the 24th infantry division which had been flown in from japan on the 5th of july 1950 task force smith attacked the north koreans at osan but without weapons capable of destroying north korean tanks they were unsuccessful the result was 180 dead wounded or taken prisoner the kpa progressed southwards pushing back the U.S. force at Pangtak, Shonan and Shuwang, forcing the 24th Division's retreat to Changjong, which was the KPA captured in the Battle of Tijong. The 24th Division suffered 362 dead and wounded, 2,962 captured, including Division's Commander Major General William F. Dean. By August, the KPA steadily pushed back the ROK Army and the 8th United States Army southwards. The impact of the Truman administration's defence budget cutbacks were now keenly felt as the US troops fought a series of costly rearguard actions. Lacking sufficient anti tank weapons, artillery or armour, they were driven down the Korean Peninsula. During their advance, the KPA purged the Republic of Korea's intelligence by killing civil servants and intellectuals. On the 20th of August, General MacArthur warned North Korean leader Kim Il-sung he was responsible for KPA atrocities. By September, UN forces were hemmed into a small corner of South East Korea near Pusan. This 140-mile perimeter enclosed about 10% of Korea in a line partially defined by the Nakdong River. Although Kim's early successes led to, to predict he would end the war by the end of August, Chinese leaders were more pessimistic. To counter a possible US deployment, Zhu Enla ensured a Soviet commitment to have the Soviet Union support Chinese forces with air cover and deployed 260,000 soldiers along the Korean border under Commander Go Gang. Zhu commanded Cha. Sheng Wen to conduct a topographical survey of Korea and directed Li Ying Fu Zhu's military advisors in Korea to analyse the military situation in Korea. Li concluded that MacArthur would most likely attempt to land it at Chi Chong. After confirming with Mao that this would be MacArthur's most likely strategy, Zhu briefed Soviet and North Korean advisor of Lee's finding and issued orders to Chinese army commanders to deploy on the Korean border to prepare for US naval activity in the Korean Strait. In the resulting Battle of Pusan Perimeter, August to September 1950, the US Army withstood KPA attacks meant to capture the city of Nantong Bolge, Po Dong, and Tigu. The United States Air Force interrupted the KPA logistics with 40 daily ground support sorties that destroyed 32 bridges, halting most daytime road and rail traffic. 
KPA forces were forced to hide in tunnels by day and move only at night. To deny material to the KPA, the USFF destroyed logistic depots, petroleum refineries and harbours while the US Navy Air Force attacked transport hubs. Subsequently, the overextended KPA could not be supplied throughout the South. On the 27th of August, 67 fighter squadron aircraft mistakenly attacked facilities in Chinese territory and the Soviet Union called the UN Security Council attention to China's complaint about the incident. The US proposed that a commission of India and Sweden determined that the US should pay in compensation by the Soviet vetoed the US proposals. Meanwhile, US garrisons in Japan continually dispatched soldiers and material to reinforce defenders in the Pusan perimeter. Tank battalions were deployed to Korea directly from the US mainland from Port San Francisco to the port of Pusan, the largest Korean port. By late August, the Pusan perimeter had some 500 medium tanks battle ready. In early September 1950, ROK Army and UN Command Forces outnumbered the KPA 180,000 to 100,000 soldiers. Against the rested and rearmed Pusan perimeter defenders and their reinforcements, the KPA were undermanned and poorly supplied. Unlike the UN Command, they lacked naval and air support. To relieve the Pusan perimeter, General MacArthur recommended that an amphibious land in Ichon, near Seoul, and well over 160 kilometres behind the KPA lines. On the 6th of July, he ordered Major General Hobart R. Gay, commander of the 1st Cavalry Division, to plan the division's amphibious landing at Inchon on the 12th to 14th of July. The 1st Cavalry Division embarked from Yokohama, Japan, to reinforce the 24th Infantry Division inside the Pusan perimeter. Soon after the war began, General MacArthur began planning a landing at Ichon, but the Pentagon opposed him. When authorised, he activated a combined US Army and Marine Corps and ROK Army Force. The X Corps, led by General Edward Armand, commander, consisted of 40,000 men of the 1st Marine Division, the 7th Infantry Division, and around 8,600 8, ROK Army soldiers. By the 15th of September, the amphibious R assault force faced a few KPA defenders at Eichon. Military intelligence and psychological warfare, guerrilla resistance and protracted bombardment meant facilitated a relatively light battle. However, the bombardment destroyed most of the city of Eichon. After the landing, the 1st Cavalry Division began its northward advance from the Pusan perimeter. Task Force Lynch after its commander, Lieutenant Colonel James H. Lynch, 3rd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, and two 70th Tank Battalions, Charlie Company and the Intelligence Reconnaissance Platoon, affected the Pusan Parliamentary Breakout. The 171.2 kilometres of enemy territory to join the 7th Army Infantry Division at Usa. The X Corps rapidly defeated the KPA defenders around Seoul, thus threatening the trap the main KPA force in southern Korea. On the 8th of September, Stalin dispatched General H.M. Seacroft to Korea to advise Kim Il-sung to halt his offensive around the Pusan perimeter and to redeploy his forces to defend Seoul. Chinese commanders were not briefed on North Korean troops, numbers or operational plans. As an overall commander of the Chinese forces, Zhu Enlao suggested that the North Koreans should attempt to eliminate their armed enemy forces at each one only if they had reserves of at least 100,000 men. Otherwise, he advised North Koreans to withdraw their forces north. On the 25th of September, Seoul was recaptured by South Korean forces. US air raids caused heavy damage to the KPA, destroying most of its tanks and much of its artillery. North Korean troops to the south instead effectively withdrawn north, rapidly disintegrated, leaving Pyongyang vulnerable. 
during the general retreat, over 25 to 30,000 North Korean soldiers managed to reach KPI lines. On the 27th of September, Stalin convened an emergency session of Politburo in which he condemned the incompetence of the KPI command and held military advisers responsible for the defeat. On September the 27th, MacArthur received the top secret National Security Council memorandum 81 stroke 1 from Truman reminded him that operations north of the 38th parallel were authorised only if, quote, at the time of such operation, there was no entry into North Korea by major Soviet or Chinese communist forces, no announcements of intended entry, nor a threat to counter our operations militarily, end quote. On the 29th of September, MacArthur restored the government of Republic of Korea under Sung Nang Ri. On the 30th of September, Defence Secretary George Marshall sent an eyes-only message to Arthur. Quote, we want to feel unhampered by tactically and strategically to proceed north of the 38th parallel, end quote. During October, the ROK police executed people who were suspected to be sympathetic to North Korea and similar massacres were carried out early in 1951. On the 30th of September, Zhu Enla warned that the United States that China was prepared to intervene in Korea if the United States crossed the 38th parallel. Zhu attempted to advise North Korean commanders on how to conduct a general withdrawal by using the same tactics which allowed Chinese communist forces to successfully escape Chiang Kai-shek's encirclement campaigns in the 1930s but by some accounts, North Korean commanders did not utilise these tactics effectively. Historian Bruce Cummins argues, however, the KPA's rapid withdrawal was strategic, with troops mounted into mountains where they could launch guerrilla raids on UN forces spread out on the coasts. By the 1st of October 1950, the UN command repelled the KPA northwards past the 38th parallel and the ROK army crossed after them into North Korea. MacArthur made a statement demanding the KPA's unconditional surrender. Six days later, on the 7th of October, with UN authorization, the UN command forces followed the ROK forces northward. The X course landed at Wonsan in southeastern North Korea and re won in northeastern North Korea, already captured by ROK forces. The 8th US Army and the ROK Army drove up east westward Korea and captured Yang Pyongyang City, the North Korean capital, on the 19th of October 1950. The 187th Airborne Regimental combat team made their first of two combat jumps during the Korean War on the 20th of October 1950 at Sunshan and Sukshan. The missions of the 187th were cut the road north going to China, preventing North Korean leaders from escaping from Poyang and to rescue US prisoners of war. At month end, the UN forces held 135,000 KPA prisoners of war. As they neared the Sino-Korean border, the UN forces in the west were divided from those in the east by 50 to 100 miles of mountainous terrain. Taking advantage of the UN command's strategic momentum against the communists, General MacArthur believed it necessary to extend the Korean War into China to destroy the despots supplying the North Korean war effort. President Truman disagreed and ordered caution at the Sino-Korean border. Thank you for listening to this week's episode, The Korean War, by the Brief History Podcast. Next week, we'll get into how China intervenes and invades Korea. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to us on your normal uh, podcast listening app. We're on all the major directories. Go back, listen to our previous episodes. If you subscribe, then you'll be notified when the next episode is uh, available. Um, And with most um, podcast apps, um, certainly on mine, when I listen to my favourite, it automatically downloads as well. So it means I don't need to do anything further. They're there waiting for me ready when I want to listen. 
Um, so uh, once again, um, subscribe. Um, if you can leave us a five star review, please do. It really does help. Um, give us a five star rating also if you don't want to leave a review. Think of it your good deed of the day. Um, we really do rely on the generosity of our listeners. Um, you guys have been absolutely marvellous so far. You've sent us some um, brilliant feedback and um, some uh, great reviews already. Please, uh, please, the more the better. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We're on Instagram and Snapchat too, on all of them with the Be History podcast. Uh, like, follow retweet share um, please do what you can reach out to us uh, we'll, we'll read out um, any positive reviews or, or even negative if there's anything further we can do to make it even better then please let us know we would really do like listening and hearing from you guys uh, thank you once again to harry edmondson who has done the music composed it himself he's uh, also done the editing and the uh, the sound so uh, thank you uh, my name is andrew i i andrew knight i've been your host for today this is the brief history podcast uh, history under the hour perfect for your commute and on your way to work on your lunch break or your precious free time. So uh, please listen to us and tell your friends. Get excited, America, because Dunkin' Go-To's are here. Double deals on breakfast sandwiches made for go-getters. Why two breakfast sandwiches? Well, maybe a co-worker eats one when you're not looking. Or maybe an eagle swoops down and steals one. Or maybe you're just double hungry. Whatever the reason, come into Dunkin' Donuts now and get two egg and cheese wake-up wraps for $2, two egg and cheese English muffins for $3, or two bacon egg and cheese croissants for $5. America runs on Dunkin'. Participation may vary. Limited time offer. Restrictions apply. Fly.